just as much as we can just start doing something, I can just turn off that TV. Yes. Like, like turn it off, right? I can just turn off NPR if I don't want to listen to it. I can just stop talking to that toxic friend if I don't want to. That has been a huge thing that helps me to, to handle stress right now. Follow the Leader features dynamic women entrepreneurs in their journeys to becoming a success in business. This podcast is an inspirational space for entrepreneurs, future entrepreneurs, and thought leaders as they share their keys to success. I am Chanel Christoph Davis, the CEO and founding partner of the largest woman and minority-owned sales tax advisory practice in the country, Davis Davis and Harmon, LLC. So today, guys, I'm so excited to welcome to the, the guest chair, our guest leader, Jacqueline M. Baker. You better not call her Jackie. That's Jacqueline. That's an inside joke, you guys. She is an author, speaker, corporate trainer, board member, fellow Royal Society of Arts Council member. We're going to talk about all the amazing things that she has accomplished. Her book is called Leader by Mistake which I have a copy of. It is very awesome. And it, it gives you kind of like a, a blow by blow our background. We're going to have a talk about that on leadership. But to, right now, I just want to introduce you guys. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited for this conversation. It's been a, a little bit in the making, but we're here. We made yes, it. We're here. We made it. We made it. That's the great thing about being in quarantine, to be honest, is that I'm able to pull together a tour de force of leaders from all over the country. And we are just all like vibing in this great way. So there's some great things that's, that are coming out of quarantine as well, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I know we'll get to some of those great things that are coming out of quarantine. And I'll say my top is being able to work out every day. Like, yeah, we're definitely going to touch upon that. Yeah. So Jacqueline, take us to the beginning. Tell us about little Jackie. <laughs> little Jacqueline. Jackie, okay. So I am originally from Detroit, Michigan. I'm a Detroiter through and through. Um, I have been here in the Washington, D.C. area for about the past seven years. And um what I'll say is it's been quite the journey being here. I, I was just telling my husband the other day that I feel like just recently and like in the last year, I got my networking stride, which we can yes. get. But it just, when you move to a new city, you, it's almost, you almost have to get the mindset that you're, you're starting from scratch and the way that you did things before and the networks that you used to have, is just not the same. And so it took me a minute to sort of kind of get my, get my footing around that. But I um, grew up in Detroit sort of small family. And I, I always ponder a bit on when I got bit by this entrepreneurial bug because yeah, I don't what from, I want to hear. Yeah. I don't come from a family of entrepreneurs. Um, honestly, I can't think of anyone, anyone, and I, I may not, I just may not be thinking hard enough, but I can't think of anyone who started the entrepreneurial path um, prior to me. And, um, and so I had a focus on music in high school. I went to Cass Technical High School and we, you usually, um, they operate like a, a college and that you almost have like little majors. So yeah. Ironically, yeah, ironically I was in music. Um, I also did my undergraduate and graduate degree in Detroit as well. So my undergrad is in public relations and my master's is in, in, is in instructional technology, which is interesting in itself because my career choices are not directly aligned to those things. I mean, I, public relations is one of those things that um, you can utilize no matter where you're at and what you're doing. And instructional technology is essentially designing training programs, which I do a bit for my the leadership and etiquette part of my business, but I'm not an instructional technologist, right? Okay. And so literally, you know, if I'm just being honest about it, my foray, my true foray into entrepreneurship started when I was working on my undergraduate degree at Wayne State University. I had a business partner named Zemin and we were good friends. We were event planners for Wayne State University. And one day we were disgruntled about our jobs. I don't know why we were, why we were disgruntled, right? But we were, and we were like, you know what? We're going to go start our own event planning business. And literally like the next day we went down to the city county building and started this business. Wow. And, so, and, and you know, I, as many mistakes as we made, and you know, I'm, I'm really transparent about the mistakes that I made, especially in my book, Leader by Mistake, I honestly wouldn't take very many back because mm -hmm. I, I, I really believe that those mistakes that we made, um, the challenges that we encountered was the solidification of many of the core principles and core values that I have today, but I only learned them through mistakes. 
Um, and so operated that business for about eight years. And while I do, I love a well-produced event. I, you know, I love to sit in an event and it's well-produced and it's done well. And, you know, all the goals are achieved. Um, event planning in itself is taxing. It's very taxing. It's a lot of it's, work. Yeah, it's a lot of work. And it's emotional. And the thing that I am not, quite frankly, is I'm not very emotional when it comes to business. And weddings have this emotional component to it that, you know, just, it just is. Yes. The good thing about the situation is that I had a business partner and my business partner, Zim and Marogi, was a, is a girly girl through and through. And as much as I dress up and put on all the colors <laughs> and all the stuff, right? Yeah. I don't consider myself a girly girl in my course. So I was a business operations director and she was the creative director. And so she handled um, trying on dresses and cake cutting and tasting and things like that. And I handle contract negotiations and things of that nature. Um, but after eight years of doing that, we both decided, you know, we're tired. Like we've had a good run. We've made some great connections, but this is not a long-term play for us. The thing that I did fall in love with Chanel is I fell in love with uh, protocol and order. Like mm -hmm. I, I enjoy that, right? I enjoy, I enjoy etiquette. And I decided that I would start a modern etiquette and protocol company. And at the time in Detroit, there was no organization that I found that was teaching etiquette in a way that I thought mattered. And in a way that I thought mattered truly meant like not tea parties and curtsying. I mean, like, how do you negotiate, girl? And how do you go from, I got to go to work and I have to wear this outfit and I need to adjust it a little bit so that I can be appropriate on a golf course or a happy hour. And I was curious just about protocol of everything, really. Yeah. And, and that's how, you know, we ended up not just teaching etiquette to teen girls, which was how we started the business. But now, eight years later in that business, we teach internationally to not only teen girls, but also professional athletes, corporate professionals. Everyone, oh, you know, uh, Yeah, we, we do that work now. So that's how I started and a, a bit of where I'm at now. Okay. Well, you know, you, you said like 20 things that I want to circle back to. One is, no, it's, it's great. I think, you know, you started your first business in college because you were really not being fulfilled working for the university. Correct. So I have a couple of questions about that process, but I also wanted to ask, I mean, I, I think that's just so key. Many entrepreneurs, me being one of them, start businesses because they feel like either they're not being seen or they're... You know, this is not, you know, I'm, feeling, I'm fitting a round peg into a square hole. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I cannot see how, you know, I can't see the, the growth or where I'm going to go with this. So that's kind of how mm -hmm. my husband and I started our business. So I think that was very important that you kind of, you glossed over it, but, but you actually put action behind it. You yeah. Didn't... We, you know, Zemin and I, looking back, we were doers. Like we're doing. Yeah, and, that's and, very odd. I, you know, and, and I really, you know, one day have to dig deep, probably with the help of a therapist or a psychologist or something, and just really dig to the root of where did this come from? I, I think a part of it honestly came from my aunt. So my aunt is really who raised me from 13. Okay. And, you know, we don't come, I don't come from a family of immense resources and, you know, name recognition and money. Like, it's just not our story. And I know you, you know, you shared your story with me as well. So that's, it's not your story either. No. And, but what we did do is we knew how to survive. Like we knew how to ends meet, you know, we, we worked, I had a job as a teen and I picked, I helped to pay household bills. Like we, we knew how to figure out how to get stuff done with few resources. Mm -hmm. And Simon had, had a similar background as mine. I think that when you come from a family where um, you, you are a doer, right? You don't, you don't get stuff handed to you. Like we figure out how to make these bills work and how to make them. Yes. I, I think that that just oftentimes, I wouldn't say that happens to everybody, but oftentimes that bleeds into your adulthood. And, and I, and the other thing I know about me, and I, and I talk about this pretty transparently because it is permeated throughout my entire career is that I'm curious. Like, mm -hmm. I am, I am su a super curious person about everything. And so the corporate jobs that I've had, you know, throughout my career, um, the new ventures that I've taken on in my, in my life, those have usually been a result of just taking the conversation. Like, oh, okay, that's an interesting conversation. Instead of saying, you know what, I didn't go to school for that, so I'm good. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm good on that because that's not right. me. Right. Yeah. I'm, I, I, I'm just curious about a lot of stuff, and I'll take meetings that sometimes don't necessarily make, make sense because it's like, wait a minute, I've never worked in shipping or pipeline, mm -hmm. navigation, but I'll talk to you. And I think there was also a piece of that where I was just like, well, we can start this business and we can 
we could figure it out. Like it can't That's be that where it goes. Yeah. yeah. I think it's too, I want to talk to you about your childhood. I would imagine based on what you're telling me about your aunts in your nuclear family, they must've given you leadership opportunities within the home. Yeah. So listen, listen, I mean, I, you had to, cause this had to come from somewhere. This is hilarious because I tell, I, I say this next statement a lot and I, I don't think I've ever said it publicly. So here we go. My aunt, um, we had the house. And when I say oh, the I house, that. okay, I mean, but I love going to the house. <laughs> the house. There was nothing extravagant or like overly luxurious about a house. It was, you know, just a house, right? Like a three bedroom house with a basement, right? It just wasn't that big, but it was a uh, number one, always filled with love. Like I, I learned <laughs> my practice of saying love you to the people who mean the most to me when I leave them every single time. But more importantly, it was the house that when you got in trouble, right? Or your parents kicked you out, that's where you could come. Yes. And so my, pa- my friends and my cousin Derek's friend, who's like my big brother, when, it, when our friends got in trouble in high school and sometimes in middle school and beyond, they got kicked out of their house and they were like, well, you know, Miss Portland, that's my aunt, Miss Portland will take me in. And she did. But the rule was, you could stay with us. We're not going to let you be in the street, but you had to do chores. Like that was the, that was the rule. Okay. You could eat with us, but you got to do chores. And so I, I do believe that um, that sense of ownership, right? And that mm-hmm. sense of, work. I mean, honestly, I had my first job when I was 13. I worked at Subway as a sandwich yep. artist. Wow. And I've not had a job since that day. Did you and say I, sandwich artist? <laughs> I've never heard of that before, but that, okay. You're a sandwich artist. <laughs> no name for a Subway sandwich maker. Okay, I didn't know. I didn't know, but I love it. Okay, go ahead. But um, yeah, it, it, I believe my aunt did definitely instill a sense of responsibility and a sense of survival, flat out. Like I think economics. Like we're gonna all eat, but everybody gonna participate in this. Participate, right. And I, yeah, I, I definitely attribute that to her. That whole even when I feel myself in a in a scenario where I'm like, oh my gosh, like I can feel the anxiety bubbling up, and as I have anxiety issues, which we I'm happy to talk about here. When I feel the anxiety bubbling up, or when I'm like scared or fearful, I'm not really sure how I'm gonna get through this my mind immediately goes to girl, you've been through worse or you can figure this out. I'll, I'll admit, I'll say, okay, you're scared. You don't know what you're doing. You can get through this. Like literally that, that is what I've trained myself to do. Even when I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how I'm going to find the money, but I figure it out. So we'll that, I, out. yep. So I, I thank you Portland works. Who's my aunt for instilling that sense of survival in me. I love that. So now your business, let's talk about your new endeavor. And I love the fact that your first business had a partner. So you didn't go on this, on this, because a lot of people think in entrepreneurship, you got to go it alone. You have to be the boss. <clears throat> you don't want to share anything with anyone. You want to be the, the main operator. But I love the fact that you guys identified that you were stronger together. Mm-hmm. That's, that's really key too. So the new endeavor, your, your focus is on protocol and order. Yeah. Like, okay, t- talk to me. Like, how did you... <laughs> It's etiquette and protocol. So here's the so here here's how we're gonna break this down. Okay? Yeah, tell me how did you even envision this? I think it's genius, but it, you know, so it has been quite the journey. I you know when I first started this work in Detroit, truly, like I truly did look around and notice that no one was teaching etiquette to teen girls. Like mm-hmm. I you know I saw tea parties and you know cutesy stuff and you know let's be cute cute cute. But I'm like wait a minute there there is there is etiquette and protocol in everything that we do. I mean, the definition of etiquette is the accepted code of behavior for particular situations, period. There's nothing fancy about that. There's not that there's, this is not just meant for rich people or people who are black or white or whatever. It's for everybody. And I was very curious about, well, who made these rules up? And, and I was curious about how do some people get access to this and, and others don't. And so I truly did start just teaching etiquette to teen girls because number one, I felt like, okay, teen girls need it. And parents are going to believe that their teens need this etiquette training. And they did. But what I did not, what I did not forecast, you know, and what I did not foresee, quite frankly, is that other people would. I didn't start this company thinking or planning to teach etiquette to people other than teen girls. Mm. It just sort of happened. And how it happened is a professional football team called me. And wow. said, hey, will you teach etiquette to our rookie players? And I was like, oh, okay, right? Me being and they, and they need it. Think about it. That's their first pro- professional role. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. But, 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 you know, when sometimes when we're presented with new stuff and this may have may happen to you in your career or other people who are listening in, in your community, you get presented with stuff and you haven't did it before and you're scared. And you say, no, I don't do that. Right. And I could have said that I could have said, no, I, you know, I teach teen girls, but my mind went to, all right, well, I know etiquette and it has to be transferable to other groups. Yes. It's February when you're calling me, you don't want me to do this until June. I could probably figure this out, right? Absolutely. I did. Between February and June, I learned, okay, how do I teach athletes? What's the attention span? How do I need to position this? What other people do I need on my team? You know, because I when, when I teach etiquette to professional athletes, I don't just go by myself. Instead, I amass a team of people that consists of, you know, a suit clothier. So they can teach them about how, what's the anatomy of a suit. A jeweler, so they can teach them about, you know, diamonds. Why do you not want to put aftermarket diamonds in a Rolex? So it's all these different, you know, components. A golf trainer, like, to, because a lot of them want to start nonprofits and they're often on the golf course. But what I didn't see beyond that, Chanel, is that I didn't think corporate. Like, I didn't think that Nike and department. Interesting. I just didn't, right? It didn't cross my mind initially. And so I, I, I've historically said I was, I was thinking small, but I, I don't think that that's a fair thing to say because I don't think that teaching teen girls etiquette is thinking small at all, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think that I, was, I wasn't dreaming big enough. I just wasn't. Mm -hmm. and, um, but, but, you know, now what that, um, what that, what, what those opportunities have opened the door for me to do is not just teach etiquette training domestically, but to teach etiquette and leadership training internationally. And, you know, that was a process because while a lot of corporations do embrace this concept of uh, we need etiquette training and we need protocol and you need to know how to do certain things, some people look at it as leadership skills, right? Yeah. And so that's this whole shift in, in word usage and vocabulary and delivery, et cetera. But that truly is how I started and a little bit about the journey of how we started with teen girls and now teach you know, internationally to a lot of different audiences. That's awesome. It's so funny. I have an etiquette in protocol story that you, you brought to mind when you were talking. When I was a, a college student in New Orleans, you know, born and raised in New Orleans, my husband and I met in college. We, um, you know, we were young, you know, but we had to embark on a career in accounting. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we went through the Career Services Center, and I never forget the Career Services Center director. She, um, was not the best dresser. She was not well dressed. And she told us, told me that I had to wear coffee colored stocking that did not match my skin tone to every interview because that was etiquette. And I, listen, I was not, I didn't have you, Jacqueline. <laughs> but it fell in my spirit that she was telling me something wrong. <laughs> I, like, I will not. I will not show up with stockings that don't match my legs. Like, that sounds crazy. Okay. Crazy. That, that speaks to, you know, there's a culture around everything. She thought she was giving me the best advice, girl. I mean, bless her heart. But you know what that also is? That, unfortunately, is the, the, the types of information that lead to people saying etiquette is old school and whack, you know, and it's not for me. And that's the reason why I have been very diligent and consistent with, number one, making sure people understand we teach modern etiquette. And yes. I'm not going to teach you stuff that doesn't make sense, right? Like, yes. I, I'm not. And, and the world has evolved, right? I mean, imagine if this were, you know, 40 years ago, and I'm still teaching African American women, like, no, you can't wear your natural hair. Right. Yes. Just, Absolutely. You know, and so etiquette and protocol, we, we gotta, we have to shift, we have to adjust, we have to realize that the world changes, and expectations around um, appearance and yes. voice and things like that have, have shifted. And I, I say all the time, that teaching um, the clothing part of, of uh, etiquette, the, what, I, what we call grooming at the company, I don't love it. And I'm, I'm, I'm very clear about that. It could I, be touchy. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, don't, I don't like it because I do truly, genuinely feel that. I feel that we, anyone, should be able to dress the way they want to dress and be judged by the value that they bring intellectually. Like, and, or just the value that they bring, period, even if it's like sweat equity. But that's, that's setting people up for failure, right? Yes, because if I, if, I, right, if I didn't tell them the truth and just say, hey, the average adult attention span is seven seconds. And people do judge you by what you choose they to wear. Yes. In protocol. If I if I just split spit these truth these untruths out here, then I will be setting a whole uh, a whole group of of young people a whole up. Generation. Yes. 
So I don't, I, I, I'm honest about the fact that I don't enjoy teaching it, but here are the expectations of certain companies. Period. Oh yeah. When, when I first started my career at PricewaterhouseCoopers, it was my first job out of college. We had two weeks of etiquette training. Mm. I mean, I, they didn't call it that, yeah. but mm. now that you're describing it, that's exactly what it was. They mm. told us how to show up. It, we had to, you know, consult CEOs, CFOs you know, treasury, um, people ahead of treasury, and they didn't want us showing up looking crazy, you know, so that's exactly what it was. So this, this, this is awesome. Mm -hmm. So um, I love what you do. So you have also parlayed that into being a, you know, like you said, a corporate trainer, you didn't start to start off thinking that, but you've, you've parlayed that. Tell us about some of your clients and some of your, your most rewarding opportunities. Oh, that's a good question. One of my most rewarding opportunities was my inter my international gig that I got last year in Grenada. Oh, I know it was great. And Grenada is such a beautiful place that quite frankly, I, I wasn't really familiar with, right? You just, you know, when you travel, when you give yourself permission to travel, you quickly learn, or you're reminded over and over again that the world is so much bigger than you. Absolutely. So it is, and it's humbling. And it is, it's, 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 that's emotional to me. You're just like, wow, this is what I've known. And then there's all of this and it's just amazing. But um, the one of the reasons why I am proud of that is because I firmly believe, and this was, that opportunity was a result of this, that when you want to do something, when you have a desire to do something, you need to put it out in the world. You need mm. to say it, you need to write it down, you need to share it with somebody and allow them to hold you accountable for it. Because I, I was sharing with uh, a colleague of mine that I wanted to teach etiquette training internationally. And he, he said, well, my mom's in Grenada. And I was like, what? And he was like, my mom's into etiquette training there. And literally that's how I got there is I was just having a conversation. And, and I think so many times when we want to do stuff and I'll, and I'll say that if I think culturally about this, there are a lot more conversations that I have with people who people of color who want to do stuff, who hold it close to the chest. I, you know, let me, let me keep it. A I secret. share it. Yes. And then other people are going to steal it. Somebody's going to steal it. Yeah, gonna steal it. And you're, and I say all the time, like, you're the magic, like you're the executor. Right. Yes. And so I, I, I believe that when you put something out in the world and I don't care what you call it, you want to call it divine intervention. You want to call it the energy around you, whatever. Right. When you put stuff out in the world, the universe responds. Period. Wow. Yes. And, you know, I can point to five examples just this year of things that I put out in the universe and I, you know, mentioned it, said it, wrote it down, made it clear, and boom! Like, look, it's it's a thing. Yes. So I'm, yes. I, I'm definitely proud of that. That's awesome. So, mm -hmm. also, I wanted to talk about, you know, you are a fellow for the Royal Society of the Arts. Please tell me what that is, and it sounds amazing. Yes. So, the Royal Society of the Arts is a fantastic organization that I had the opportunity to become acquainted with through volunteer work. Okay, so I want to touch on like volunteer work for literally just a second, because there are some people that um, want to start stuff, right? And I, I know they're listening here on, on, in your community. They want to start stuff and they don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. And you're often thinking, uh, you know, and then you just decide to not start anything. You're just like, I don't know what to do. Yeah, I mean, you feel paralyzed. You're like, oh, yeah. Yep, absolutely. And so um, I was doing some volunteer work with an organization in Atlanta. You know, they asked me to come down and teach to, to, to young girls, which people ask me to do often. I can't say yes all the time, but sometimes I do. And as a result of being there, there was a young woman who was also there volunteering. She was there from L.A. And she's a fellow at the Royal Society of, Art, of, of the Arts, which is out of London. We have fellows all across the world, tens of thousands of um, fellows that do dynamic work in food insecurity, in racial disparities, in tech and society, making fashion more accessible to royal fashion more um, success, um, acceptable um, or accessible to, to, to more people. There are a, a wealth of different things that RSA does, but the reality is I, I, I look at it in, in, in terms of I had to make a move, right? I had to volunteer. And then as a result of me volunteering, there was somebody else there who was advocating for more people of color to be a part of the Royal Society of the Arts. Okay. And, um, and so I, you know, I, I always think about some of my most dynamic opportunities and they came as a result of giving, right? When you give yeah. and not always given money, right? Like, you know, I, I don't have endless pockets, but, but just figuring out a way, like, how can I serve? How can I provide something to other people? And then it just, it comes back to you and opportunities like this and being a fellow here, truly was a result of me being at a place and giving. So what do you do as a part of your role? 
Yeah. So there's programming that happens all over the all over the world, actually. So depending on where you're at, so I'm here in the Washington, D.C. area, there's different programming that we put on to serve this particular area in these subjects. There's ways for you to grow as a leader in the organization. There's fundraising opportunities, but essentially uh, we influence through education, we influence through policy, we influence through convening. Um, but the, the great thing is that is an, it is an organization that's connected all over the world with fellows all over the world that you really, truly do have at your fingertips. That's awesome. Yeah. You're, you're, I tell you, your bio is fascinating. And it's just, I mean, I, I love every time I bring up a different aspect of w- what you do, you light up. So yeah, I, can yeah, tell you, I love my work. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you are living in your purpose. And I think that is absolutely beautiful. And you kind of teed up our next thing I want to talk, talk about is your podcast. So I was on your podcast and I love your podcast because it's so key. A lot of people ask me, because I've been an entrepreneur my, basically my entire adult life. I've been working for myself longer than I've worked for other people. Mm-hmm. They always ask me, how did you start? You know, like, what, what made you want to do this? And, you know, it, it seems so quizzical and just so mysterious to people. But you really dedicated your podcast to really address a lot of those, those, those I guess, beginner, starter, pivotal questions that people have in their mind. Yeah, you know, I I will say that the podcast did does serve a purpose for me. Um, I wouldn't say that it's a purpose that's more important of the purpose, but I do want to be honest about how the podcast came to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had operated uh, a blog called Scarlet Says um, for many many years, maybe like six years. And to be honest, I never loved I never loved writing for the blog ever. Okay. It was painful because although I am an author and there are many more books that will be written, I never say I'm a writer, right? Because mm-hmm. I'm not somebody who just sits down day in and day out and writes. It's just it's not. Blows out your fingertips. It's not like, yeah, yeah. Not it. That is not my move, right? And so every month, or no, actually every week for the past six years, I have been um, producing a, a blog and producing content because as an entrepreneur, one thing that you want to always be able to do is. Um, have some regularity and have some content that consistently goes out that your audience is used to seeing, right? Yeah. Consistent. And I've been doing that for quite some time, but I never loved it. And I decided actually a couple of years ago, quite honestly, that I wanted to do a podcast and I just launched it last year. But the reality is I'm naturally a talker. I speak, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. I, it's just, it is naturally how I communicate and it's what I'm most comfortable doing. And so it, it serves that. It serves that component for, for me every single week. There's content that comes out from Just Start, on, on Just Start From Ideas to Action on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, it's there. But, but honestly, beyond that, the, the thing that is so magical to me about um, the podcast is that people genuinely tell the stories, not just the good stuff, but the bad stuff and how they started. And every single story is unique. And what that does for the community is it allows people to foresee what's possible for them because yeah. you may you, know, you may see you know the most successful people on TV or um, on social sharing information or sharing news and you're just like well, I just don't connect there and that's that's yeah. not my story and yeah. I didn't, yeah yeah that's not my thing I didn't have an inheritance or you know I wasn't connected in that way or I'm not an extrovert and what the podcast does seeks to do and does is to provide a cadre of different stories, angles, entry points, mistakes, so that people can see themselves and somebody else and realize, you know what, I am capable of starting something. They started, they had a rough time. I can do that too. And so that is, um, the podcast brings a lot of joy to my life. It really, really does. I really enjoy the the, the platform. Have you you heard back from anybody who's, that's that's the, the gem of it all too, when you start hearing back from listeners. Oh, yes. Yeah, so... I have been so pleased with the Apple podcast reviews. Uh, so, you know, I, I, you know, the, the good, the great, the, you know, magical thing about being an entrepreneur is, you know, upfront, you get support from people and there are people that, you know, right. Or their, their referrals. But when you start getting reviews and input and five stars from people that you've never met before, you never met before, I know. It's, it is just, it is the, the light of your life, right, for, for the moment or for, forever. And so that's what I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of feedback from people who I don't know. And one woman's um, feedback that she just left it not too long ago, I just thought it was the sweetest thing that she said. She said, you know, it's almost like listening to 
um, a, a friend from, um, it, it's almost listening, like listening to wise counsel from a good friend. Mm. And I don't know her. I've never met her before, but that is what I want. I want people to feel like, you know what, we're, we're relatable. And that's what she said. She said, it's like, it's an eye level conversation. It's not, you know, terms that you're never going to get or not over your head. Yeah. Just like, Hey girl, this is, this is where I messed up at. Don't do that. Okay. So I, um, I thank you for asking, asking me that because that, that truly, um, does make me feel good that there are reviews coming back from people that I don't know. Yeah. It's awesome. And it has legs that you would have never imagined. So it's really, really fun. I'm sure with your podcast too. You're just like, wow, I'm just touching lives everywhere. Yeah. I go to conferences or, I go, you know, or not anymore. Not, not for 2020. <laughs> <laughs> but I have in the past attended conferences and people walk up to me who I know, I know them, but you know, it may be a, a person who I'm trying to do business with really, mm-hmm. to be honest with it. It may be a person in the corporate environment that I've been trying to reach out to and they come up to me and they're like, I love your podcast. I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah. You've been listening? Yeah. It, it blows me away every single time. So yeah, I, I absolutely love it. So I do want to, uh, I would be remiss because you, you kind of touched upon it earlier before we round out our conversation. I do want to talk about the fact that we are in the middle of a pandemic. Mm-hmm. We're in the middle of COVID-19. And I think this is going to be, 2020 is going to be a year for the history books. I think that, you know, people are going to study this time period. So many things are happening. I mean, racial unrest. Uh, historic election, the end of the year, you're in Washington, D.C., which I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine because we're like overwhelmed with news and we're not, we're, I'm in Texas, so you're in D.C. Um, how do you cope with all of the information and the news and it's constantly incoming, incoming, incoming? How do you balance that with, you, you know, your anxiety and... Uh, really the uncertainness of this time we don't i mean i think for me when this all started in march i i kicked into alpha mode and started planning you know getting my team to be you know working from home and you know i but i still did not imagine mm-hmm. because we were in the end of almost the end of july that school next year will be canceled <laughs> like we're looking at my daughter is not going to be going to school in the fall she's mm-hmm. going to be learning virtually is it's, we don't know when this is going to end. It seems like it's going on and on and on. Um, how do you cope with that? What are, what are some of, I want you to share with the audience some tools that you use um, to manage anxiety and uncertainness. Yeah. And I'll, I'll set the context as it relates to anxiety too. My anxiety is, um, is always turned up, right? So COVID, COVID's here, but you know, the level of anxiety that I think a lot of people are feeling right now is honestly my levels of anxiety pretty regularly. And the reason why that is, is because since I was 19, uh, or when I was 19, I was diagnosed with anxiety disorder. And I I thought I was having a heart attack. I I was working at a bank, which is my first real job because they offer benefits. Um, I uh, had an anxiety attack and um, I, I thought I was having a heart attack. You know, all the vitals were fine. They were just like, no, no, you have an anxiety attack and here's some medicine. And I took medicine for a little while, but then I realized, you know, I, I don't have an interest in taking medicine for the rest of my life. For this. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. There must be another way. And so for me, the, the reason why I wanted to share that is because, you know, every time I speak, every time I get on stage, um, anytime I have to have, you know, a, a business meeting, there is a, an, a heightened level of anxiety for me and not like, oh no, I'm a little fearful. Like literally it feels like I'm about to drown mm. and, like, every time I'm about to get on stage, every single time from the first time we met when I was, when we were speaking down at, um, power conference in um, in Dallas, I, you know, that anxiety was there and there are a couple key things that I do. Okay. And tactical things that, that are worth noting. Okay. One, I am very, very uh, careful with consumption of caffeine. Caffeine is a trigger for me. And caffeine just, you know, if you, if you look up ways to avoid anxiety, caffeine's on the list for almost everyone. Okay. The tough part of, the, of caffeine is that it's addictive. And if you've been drinking it your whole life, you know, you're relying on it for other reasons. But for me, I like the taste of coffee. So I drink decaf. That's just what okay. I do. For me, it's also skin on skin contact. So in the morning time, when my anxiety is really high, I literally roll over and I'm looking for my husband for a hug because that helps to lower my anxiety. 
also, I am honest. If I'm having anxiety, I will just say, hey, Jacqueline, like literally, I'll, if I'm here by myself and I'm about to go live on an interview or something that, that I'm nervous or scared about, I'll say, hey, you're having anxiety. Take a breath. You did this before. Cool out. Like, I, I just, I'm honest about it because sometimes we go into this, I don't know what's happening. I don't know. You know what's happening. Like, you're scared or you're, you know, you're, you're jealous. I mean, even if we go super personal, for some people, they're struggling with anxiety and stress because of what or who they allow to be on their social feeds. So we follow all these people on social media and then you scroll every day comparing yourself and oh no, I wish I had this. And you know, I wish I had that. Well, you don't even know if they got that and you're in control. Like you can unfollow those people at any time. All right. So for me, if I'm ever scrolling and I see a competitor and they figured out something that I've been trying to figure out and I get that spike, I'm like, okay, Jacqueline, you probably jealous. Like, let's just, this is, that's what it is. You're jealous. And what you going to do? Are you going to keep following them? Can you deal with it? Make a decision. And so I'm very um, direct and open about my anxiety because honestly, the, the more I've been open about this, the more women in particular have been like, oh, me too. And I've either been nervous or scared. I didn't want to tell anybody, but to, to get to the root of your question about um, COVID and how to deal with it, I am very careful also with how much news I consume, mm. right? That's my TV cool. is sitting right in front of my desk up here. And for, you know, the first month, month and a half, it was always on CNN. And there was always a ticker over on the right-hand side that said, how many people died? How many people got COVID, US, and in, across the world? And, you know, honestly, even though it's a simple passive thing and every, every now and then I look up, that's anxiety inducing, mm. right? And, and it's this, let's, think, let's be honest, a lot of times the news, it's just consistently the same stories over yeah. and over. <laughs> It's over and over and over again. And just like my motto in so much of life is just start, just as much as we can just start doing something, I can just turn off that TV. Yes. Like, like turn it off, right? I can just turn off NPR if I don't want to listen to it. I can just stop talking to that toxic friend if I don't want to, right? Yes. It's just a choice. And so I, I, that has been a huge thing that helps me to, to, handle, um, to handle stress right now. The other thing too that I've tried to not do Chanel is I've tried to not get back to normal. Like I'm not trying to get back to where things were on March 13th, the last time I went to the office, because if I, you know, if I'm honest and I encourage your community and your audience to be honest too, if I look at the columns, the wins and the losses, I will say hands down, the death and destruction is terrible, right? And if I can give the death and destruction back and, you know, please take it back. But if I look at my wins and losses column, I've had a lot of things in the win column since I've been, you know, focused. I haven't been all over the place distracted. I've been on a plane every other day. Mm -hmm. um, and so I um, have also just allowed myself to sit in this for a second and just be That's honest. Good. What have I, you know, where have I won and where, 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 where have I not won? And, and for me, the win column is a little bit longer, right? It is a little longer and I, like, I, like I said before, despite death and destruction, right, my, I've, I've had some wins in this column. And, and so I encourage people to, as much as we want to get back to normal and make things back the way they were and have consistently, consistency in our lives, just truly take an audit and see, are there things that you have been able to do and accomplish as a result of this unexpected crazy that's going on? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's funny. I posted uh, earlier this week and I, I did not want to give people anxiety. And I did get a private message when I posted it. That wasn't my intention. Um, I posted a conversation I had with myself in 2019. And I, I said, you know, universe, I have so many things I want to accomplish, but I feel so stretched thin. I'm traveling nonstop. I, I, I can't, you know, execute everything that's in my head. And the universe told me in 2020, okay, I didn't give you four months to, to, to settle down. So what have you done with the four months I gave you? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and I, and I hear a lot of people that say, um, you know, don't be productive. Do, you know, do what you want to do during this time, take time. And you know what? Do that. Like do that I, I do that. Like, but I will say at the same time, if there are people who are just like, Hey, I'll probably never have another time in my life where I'm working from home. I can avoid traffic. Right. Yeah. I, I have flexibility. I can go take a walk at two in the afternoon if I'm stressed out. There is, you know, it's not going to, unless this continues, which I don't want it to continue, but this is a rare time in life. And so for, I think the people who are outwardly like, be productive, be great, you know, get out here, start stuff. 
if that's if that message resonates with you, okay. If, yeah, it, right. if it doesn't, there's also a crew of people that are just like live your best life, right? Um, do self care, which we can do a whole nother thing. It's a whole podcast. <laughs> Girl. Yes, but um, I, I I think just find your tribe, find the message that resonates with you, but don't ridicule other people because that's the message that they're living right now. Right? Yeah, because I mean, for me, it, it it it's translating into a, a lot of different things. Spending more time with my family, we are closer than ever. We we live in Texas in the, uh, around tons of lakes that we've never visited before. Mm-hmm. We take a, we go at least every two weeks and visit a new lake. We're we're boating. We're doing all this stuff that. We could have been going, you know, like, right, right, right. But we never took the time to slow down enough to seek these things out. So for me, that's a part of it. But I am being very productive work wise as well. I, I wrote it. Yeah, you know, I, I did. I'm, I'm doing amazing things. So, you know, you got to kind of figure out where on the spectrum you want to lie. And it's probably going to move around. It's going to move around throughout this time. So, yeah. So, that yeah, this is good. This is really good. I'm going to actually write these up. These are going to be a part of your, you know, your post when I post this interview. This is really, really good. I appreciate you being so open and honest and sharing. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I was talking to a young lady uh, earlier today. Um, she was at, she's in the innovation entrepreneurship space right now. And she was asking some, some questions. She's about to graduate from college. And she was like, wow, I've never talked to anybody who, you know, who has reached your level, whatever your level means, right? who um, who just, is just honest like this. And I say, you know what? I think it is such a disservice when we mm-hmm. have amassed a set of, um, a, a, a set of, of knowledge and information and experience and a, a, amassed a set of mistakes. And we true, choose to hoard that information. Hold it in. Mm-hmm. Hoard those mistakes when we know that that can make the next generation of folks smarter, more effective, and more, more efficient. And I'll say that I think we've come a long way, particularly as women, in passing this stuff along, right? The embarrassing mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. But there's still, you know, a substantial amount of women, which I, I don't want to throw stones too hard because that's what they knew to, to be great. But I think there's a, 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 you know, a contingency of women who are just like, hey, you clamored, I, I struggled, and so I figured it out. out on your own. Struggled yeah. when you figure it out too. And I guess, you know, if that's your thing, that's your thing. I, I believe the exact opposite of that. I think it's a disservice for me to, all this information and all these mistakes and not make the next woman better and make this world better. My goal is to, when I leave here, is that this world's going to be a better place because of the things that I share and the mistakes I made and the, and the ones that I share with other people to make sure they don't make them. And and I, I take great pride in making sure that I do that pretty consistently. Well, thank you. you know what? That was a great button. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you wrapped that up. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're going to just end right there with that quote. I loved it, Jacqueline. You, I mean, listen, again, I want everyone to follow you. I'm going to drop all of your links in the show notes, but your book is Leader by Mistake. They can find it at leaderbymistake.com. That's your latest book. Your firm is uh, at scarletcom.com. So we're going to put all those links so everyone have an easy way to reach you. But if anyone else wants to check you out, do you have any other platforms? Yeah, absolutely. Do connect with me on Instagram and on Twitter. That's at Magical Jacks. Yes, that's my real Instagram and Twitter name. Magical, M-A-G-I-C-A-L-J-A-X. Um, that's on Instagram and Twitter. And of course, I'm on Facebook. Um, I always call myself, I'm an old millennial. So I, I can rock on Facebook and rock on some other platforms too. But, and, I, and of course, I'm on LinkedIn, which I'm LinkedIn, actually- you're, you're very active on LinkedIn. I'm very active. I, I, I say. sleep on LinkedIn. People sleep on LinkedIn, okay? Yeah. A lot of money on LinkedIn. There's some gems. There's some money to be made on LinkedIn. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, but please do feel free to, to connect with me. I would love to, to talk with anyone and, and share insights, of course. Thank you, Jacqueline. This has been wonderful. You're Yay. welcome. Thank you for having me, Chanel. Awesome. You can find all of our past episodes on iTunes, Spotify, and Google, or any of your other favorite podcast platforms. Be sure to subscribe to the show, rate, and leave us a review. Let us know how we're doing. Thank you for listening.